in our concluding remarks, mm. just to summarize, I mean, I remember where we were when uh, we were brainstorming this diagram and uh, Roba had just begun her PhD. We were outside my office from memory. Uh, and we said, what, what, what just clicked there? What just happened? And uh, we drew these concentric circles because I was I think, trying to show you the different views or share them together. And this is what came out. You've got the satellites up in, up in space. You've got different kinds of systems, you know, bolted onto buildings. You've got street views on the ground with cars driving around, taking photographs like Google Street View cars. You've got person view systems like Google Glass or the ITAP device of Steve Mann. And then you've got the embedded devices, the sensor view. And all of these are like a concertina. You can start at the middle and lift that middle piece up and then come down. And we started to think about hierarchical positioning systems given my network's background, but then Michael started to place lens of philosophical thoughts on top, as did Christine Paraxlis in a later uh, iteration of this diagram for MIT Press, um, where she talks about borders of surveillance and borders of privacy. But if we look at the implantable in its strictest context, we now have maybe a medical device like this St. Jude um, defibrillator, and it's in the body. What can it do? What can it tell us? Well, it can give us a lot of information. Maybe it can give us an ECG reading. Maybe it can report back that the person's heart is beating quite well. But it also streams a lot of data out of it, right? You go to rest in the evening by your bedside and information is taken from the device and uploaded back to banks. In fact, it doesn't go to you as the user, as the bearer of the technology, it goes back to base, it goes back to the manufacturer. The manufacturer is more interested in faults, in fault tolerance, in exceptions, in red flags, uh, in its um, uh, continuous use, uh, in any activity that has occurred that should be detected. And here we are, here's the embedded device. Uh, a lot of people now in, in the world are, are bearing these. In fact, the NIH says that 10% of Americans are bearing some kind of implantable device. Not all of them are digital, but 10% um, of Americans. And that number will only increase as our, as our lifespan increases. But there was a case in January 30th of 2017 where the police used pacemaker data to charge a homeowner with arson. Uh, a man, 54, 55 years of age, had attempted to put his uh, house on fire. He succeeded. And what actually happened was that he had um, gasoline on his shoes and on his clothes. When the officer went to visit the lieutenant, he smelt on the man's clothing and thought, how did this man who's, you know, looks quite slow and large, how did he move four sort of large bags out of the house with his belongings? So the, the information was subpoenaed from the pacemaker device, a, um, a, um, a cardiac cardiologist, a specialist, actually uh, looked at the contents of the ECG had, that had emanated from the device, made an assessment on the person's health and said this man could not have rushed in a panic to take four bags outside the house. He was the first person who was, if I can say, snitched on in the American way, snitched on by his pacemaker device. And that was really the first full-blown case of surveillance, where the implantable mm allows for the dissemination of data that actually incriminates as evidence. It's, it's evidence, right? So today we take um, Opal cards or tap and go cards for transportation. The transport network knows whether we're traveling north or south. It actually even knows our speed between stations because all of this is timestamped and you're on a, a train, for example, that's going through different signal stations. But what if the new devices we start to acquire and start to implant and start to bear and wear as body area networks begin to actually leave trails of not only identity chronicles, not only location chronicles, not only condition chronicles, but even towards the, the thought of context where we are saying, because we know all of this information, we can predict what you're thinking. And so MG Michael calls this the axis of access, as Robert said, and it's about the capability of the implantable, but also who has the right to access? As me, the end user, who has the device embedded in their body, 
I don't have the right to access. In fact, Medtronic have even barred people who have an implantable diabetic device. They have told those people that they can't have access. So many of them have hacked into older Medtronic devices through programmers and started to create apps for themselves to monitor their health better. And so the patient, rather than being right at the top of the access of the accessibility of one's data that emanates from one's body, from the device that one is bearing, is at the lowest end of the spectrum. And yet, as we go up the scale, we can see that the police with a warrant have greater access to your implantable than you do. The specialist interpreter, like the cardiologist, the manufacturer who has built the device and, and talks about something called the right to switch off. We saw this with Google Glass. If you were one of the 1,800 people or so who uh, had a Google Glass, um, the company actually had a, a, a terms and conditions that said we have the right to switch off remotely. Well, will manufacturers or suppliers of different um, em embeddables or wearables or devices that we require and start to, 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 to need to exist, like we need the mobile phone to exist, but what if they have the right to switch off remotely? And so the hackers have the access, the manufacturers, the secret intelligence organizations, but the poor old humble end user is locked down. And so that's a bit of the, the, the moment we want to leave you with here is how will we go to what's called near real time or real time prediction? What does it mean as we're building this infrastructure, this web beyond social media? Imagine social media within. Imagine mm. multimodal biometrics, the DNA stored within on the implant. Imagine a highly encrypted implant, which many uh, resellers are selling now, and basically saying, why aren't we implanted, implanting everyone at birth? And I leave you with tying this to COVID. I'm not saying to you tomorrow there will be implants for COVID. In fact, I don't believe that personally. What I do believe in is a, personally is a, is a trajectory towards contactless and frictionless. And in a talk I gave recently to the Phoenix mobile uh, uh, community, I said, we, we will certainly have contactless. We will not have frictionless. Contactless doesn't always mean frictionless. You just have to ask a group of elderly people who are trying to use uh, a QR code to scan in, to visit a retail store, to eat a sandwich or a, have a coffee, that holding their hand for 30 seconds straight is not possible when the when this QR code is, is high above to scan. But what if the, the next iteration of this data, you know, check in, check out, tell us where you're going. We, we, we really need you to be vaccinated to get on a Qantas plane. We really need you to have a device that requires, okay, maybe this is the future. But the question will be at what price? As Rover's last point was, um, this, this notion back to the Netherlands report you were reading, Rover, at what price? At what price of privacy? Um, and at what cost? And so in our bid to say that technology will be the answer and the solution to our woes, quite possibly we may be finding ourselves enslaved. In, enslaved in a point of no return. But that's where I think we'll leave it. And thank you so much for your patience. We've talked for such a long time. <laughs> no, I, I thank you all for a wonderful presentation. I think we certainly, even, I mean, I, who am somewhat steeped in all of this, um, was fascinated by the uh, the elucidation of the trajectory. And I'm always sort of fascinated by the trajectory because that's one way we, I think, get to see the future. 